for tonight and next month, God willing, the title is The French Connection, A History of the Huguenots, as the 11th chapter of the Hebrews is intended to strengthen us to do what the opening of the 12th chapter states, to run the race that is set before us looking out to Jesus. That is specifically the intention uh, of all these lectures. Now, who are these Huguenots? The origin of the name itself is uncertain. There are various explanations, but I don't intend to waste time or weary you in giving you all the various possibilities. The most likely one seems to be it was a faulty French pronunciation of the German word Eidgenossen, which means confederates. And it became used of the Huguenots in Geneva and in France when, because of various political and other circumstances, they were forced to unite and to close ranks uh, to preserve their witness and testimony to the gospel. So that very possibly is the meaning of the word. Quite apart from following on in a natural way from the study of John Calvin, uh, we should also remember that uh, because of the nature of the story and the persecutions that the Huguenots in France endured for the greater part of two and a half centuries, many of them emigrated to other countries in Europe, including this country. And the details of this will emerge as we proceed. And when I tell you, for example, in a very brief way, how much they influence our society, this will show you why, in a sense, we should remember their influence. When I give some random examples, for example, that the, the man who designed and built Westminster Bridge in London was a Huguenot. The man who designed the dredging equipment to build Westminster Bridge was a Huguenot. The man who designed the gardens at Hampton Court, he was a Huguenot. And I wouldn't want you to go away with the impression that the Huguenots overran us, but they certainly made various contributions to British national life. The first governor of the Bank of England was a Huguenot. I could go on, but to give a very recent example of the continuing influence of them in our culture and in our history, one only has to cite the recent Gulf War. The British commander, Sir Peter de la Belliere, was in fact, or is in fact, a descendant of two uh, of, of Huguenots, uh, two brothers who left the south of France in 1685. They fled to this country because of the persecution. They later served in Huguenot regiments under the British crown. They served under William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne, uh, where the great Huguenot general, the Marshal Schomburg, had left the service of Louis XIV because he was a Protestant and likewise joined forces with uh, William of Orange. And that itself is a fascinating story. And any of you who take the banner of Truth magazine will see uh, in the current issue a little extract on this subject which gives some of the details. The link then with our past is a good reason why we should consider the Huguenots. I've already mentioned the link with John Calvin. Basil Hall, a Calvin scholar, has said that, in a sense, Calvin may be regarded as the greatest Huguenot of them all. And there's a sense also in which the Huguenots were Calvin's people. Because, in a very real sense, more so in France than any other of the Protestant countries of Europe, the teachings that Calvin declared uh, in Geneva were particularly set forth and practically applied in the country of his homeland. It shouldn't be forgotten that uh, Calvin was not Swiss, although he spent much of his ministry in Geneva, he was French, and therefore he had a deep affection for uh, his, his native people. So these are some of the reasons why this subject is so important. Now there's a sense in which it's impossible to cover the vast subject we're thinking, really, of the greater part of three centuries of history. And I'm having to exercise myself with tremendous restraint. Even if I was to keep you until 10 o'clock tonight, we'd still only be scratching the surface. But that would be presuming on your patience. So I, I wouldn't even think of such a thing. But let me start off by saying that, in a sense, the two lectures, tonight and next month, cover two broad periods. The first one 
we may say is the period of political Protestantism, and the second half, the second part, is concerned with the non-political Protestantism of the period. There's a sense in which we are more familiar with the latter. We are not happy with the political involvement of Protestantism in the past for various reasons. But there's a sense in which that was inevitable for one simple reason, that as the Reformation was a Bible-based evangelical protest against the dominance and the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church for many centuries, since the Church of Rome was so intimately tied up with the entire political situation, it was impossible, therefore, for the emerging churches of the Reformation not themselves to be involved in the politics of the day. It was inconceivable. It was only after the battle for religious liberty was fought and won with much blood that was shed by the, the early Protestants, it was only then, in a sense, that the more familiar situation that we enjoy still, what it has become. See, we're used to religious liberty. We're used to church and state being separated. But the times that we're thinking of this evening, uh, such an idea w w was the seed of anarchy and confusion. And the political domination of things Christian was something which took a long time to um, overthrow. I think it may be true to say that the whole story of the Huguenots is probably the greatest epic in the whole history of the Christian faith in terms of suffering, and courage versus uh, corruption and all imaginable tyranny. It is a most astonishing story, and uh, I trust that uh, we will understand something of it as we, as we proceed. Now, in the last decade, there were two important anniversaries, which uh, I must just remind you of. In 1985, for example, that was the tercentenary of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which was the taking away of what liberties the French Protestants did have, which were granted to them in 1598. They were taken away in 1685 by King Louis XIV, and this unleashed the most terrible persecution, the details of which would give you nightmares if you dwelt upon them for too long. You cannot understand the French Revolution without an understanding of Huguenots, because in 1989 was the bicentenary of the French Revolution. And when I studied uh, French history at university, we studied the French Revolution, no reference was ever made to the Protestants and their sufferings of the previous two centuries. And I've come subsequently to the conclusion that you do not understand the French Revolution without the understanding of what happened to the Protestants. Indeed, one of the great leaders of the French Revolution, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his work, The Social Contract, Contract Social, he said that the best of the French Revolution was the result of French Protestantism, the best of the French Revolution. It had a worst as well, the reign of terror, promoting of atheism, and uh, a new tyranny replaced the old tyranny. But uh, that much must uh, be said. So these things are of tremendous importance for us. Indeed, what happened over these centuries partly explains why France to this day is such a barren field of for missionary endeavor. There are many Christians who labor uh, in France, and if we find it difficult to make inroads into the modern English mind uh, with all that we face, if we find that difficult enough, then, of course, the French evangelical today finds it much harder because the treatment of the Protestants and the whole attitude of religion has, in a sense, closed the French mind off. They've had enough of religion, they've had enough of persecution, and all they want is freedom and materialism and, if you like, an exaggerated example of the kind of social and spiritual problems we have today. Where do we, therefore, begin? Well, we must begin, in a sense, where the whole of the Reformation period begins. The late Middle Ages. What was characteristic of the period in the 1480s, 1490s, and the early decades of the 16th century? Well, the church was decadent. She was in the grip of 
a superstition. There was widespread ignorance of things spiritual. There was much greed on the part of the, the wealthy classes of society. There was much political intrigue. And the general state of French society was one of poverty, uh, despair. They were heavily taxed. There was widespread ignorance of many things. And they were, generally speaking, an enslaved society. Now, what we must not forget either is that the message of the Reformation was zealously welcomed by many, many people. Indeed, it was a mark of great wonder to Calvin and the other reformers in all the countries what a tremendous thirst and appetite there was for the gospel. Very different from our own times. We often think perhaps, well, we preach the same gospel as the reformers, and yet the response seems quite minimal. But we also should remember that unless the Holy Spirit creates the appetite in the heart of men and women for the truth, they will never respond to it. And all the reformers acknowledged that it was the, the mighty movement of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and minds of men and women that made them open to the preaching of the gospel. The message of reform was welcomed, and it was a liberating power in every possible sense. And what it did, because of the background that I very briefly and inadequately described, it had a wonderful elevating effect upon the human spirit. It uh, ennobled human life. It dragged many families and individuals out of the, the quagmire of ignorance and superstition and despair. It had a wonderful liberating effect. And uh, there's no doubt that we are fast approaching, if we haven't arrived, at a similar darkness and deadness. And who knows that when we've reached that low point, the Lord may either come in his glory, which he may well do, or he might indeed uh, raise up another great Reformation movement as he did in the 16th century. Now in the year 1521, four years after Martin Luther had made his great protest in Germany, France was threatened by Germany and the Emperor Charles V at the instigation of the Pope. And King Francis I of France was to be driven from Italy. That was the political, that's the kind of information that would have made the headlines um, at the time, so to speak. And yet there was, amongst the minds of churchmen throughout France, uh, a response to the stirrings of a return to the Bible that was now making headlines in Germany. And one of the leaders of this great movement in France was Guillaume Briconnet, who was the Bishop of Meaux, which is near Paris. And he favoured the reform. His mind was open to what was happening elsewhere. And he was also assisted by a Jacques Lefeuve, who was born in Picardy in northern France, and he was 70 years of age, and he was Doctor of Theology at the University of Paris. What's rather remarkable about this man is that through his own studies in the ancient fathers and uh, the scriptures, he began to preach justification by faith before Luther did. It may be said that the Reformation preceded the work of Luther. It began, in a sense, some years before in France. This man had discovered it, and he was preaching it, and was awakening a great deal of interest. Another important individual, someone whom might be a little more familiar to, was uh, Guillaume, or William Farrell. Now, Farrell was Calvin's great forerunner in Geneva. He was born in 1489 at Gap, near Grenoble, in Dauphiny, which is southeastern France. And he became a pupil of the older Lefeuve. Lefeuve was like Moses, Farrell was like Joshua. And uh, a wonderful relationship developed between these two men. But uh, persecution soon began to appear uh, in France against the uh, new uh, thoughts about the gospel. And so this persecution drove Farrell to Switzerland. But another man arose uh, in Paris who would have made a tremendous impact upon the whole course of the French Reformation. His name was uh, Louis de Bourquin, and he was uh, a noble, and he had a tremendous noble bearing. He was a wonderful soul, and he responded to the preaching of the gospel. Indeed, some writers suggest that he might have been a French Martin Luther. He was a powerful man. But um, 
Unlike Luther, who early on had defense, had the support of the German princes, this man was by himself. He was eventually arrested for his Protestantism, and he was executed uh, in 1529, so early in his life and ministry. And it was said of him by an eyewitness that no one died in a more Christian manner at the stake than uh, Louis de Bourgoin. Now, around this time, the ideas of justification by faith began to uh, be talked about and spread throughout the local populace in Paris and uh, its uh, surrounding areas. And people began to put two and two together, and they said the doctrine of the Pope and all, all this attention to the Virgin Mary, the doctrine of the Mass and the repetition of our Saviour's sacrifice, we don't find this anywhere in our Bibles. The Christianity of the Church of Rome was not the Christianity of the Bible. And this kind of thinking spread like wildfire amongst the people. So much so that a number of very brave spirits, they put up some placards against the Mass all over Paris. You know, they painted them. The graffiti of the time, you might say. But here, in favor of the Gospel. Many were seized. Instantly, the authorities jumped on this liberalizing activity. And between November the 13th, 1534, and March the 13th, 1535, many Lutherans, as they were initially called, were burned for heresy. On January the 29th, 1535, 73, 73 were burned for their Lutheran ideas, as they were called. Now, what we don't often uh, remember is that when John Calvin published his Institutes of Christian Religion. The first edition, which was a relatively slender volume compared with what it later grew into, when he published that in 1536 in Baal, in exile, he published it. He didn't simply publish it, as it were, because he decided to give the church a modern systematic theology. It was written to commemorate the memory of those first martyrs in France, to justify their sufferings, and to bring to the attention of the French king to whom it was dedicated, uh, the truths for which these people had been arrested and cruelly burned uh, at the stake. That, then, is the origin of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian uh, Religion. And following Luther's death in 1546, of course, John Calvin became the leader of the Reformation in Europe and especially in France. Now, we mustn't forget either that uh, technology had made great strides at that time, in particular the high technology of the printing press. We shouldn't forget that uh, in those days printing was a tremendous quantum leap in communication, just as computers are uh, in our present time. And naturally, these men, they were far-sighted. They seized the printing press and all its possibilities to spread the gospel. So the printing presses were busy in Geneva. Books flooded into France. And by the mid-1550s, apparently, an estimated one-sixth of the population had embraced the reform. There were stirrings in the province of Saint-Ange, and many monks were influenced by these biblical teachings. Some of them fled to the Isle of Oloron, which is on the Atlantic west coast. And many of these were arrested and burned in Bordeaux in 1546. The gospel spread very rapidly throughout France, particularly in the south, in the region of Lyon and Toulouse. And it reached uh, ordinary people. Indeed, one of the most remarkable things about the French Reformation was that it wasn't just a middle-class movement. Many of the nobles were touched by the gospel. Many of the middle class, which generally occupy the greatest number of people, but also many of the ordinary working class also, their minds were enlightened to receive the gospel. There was a, a shoemaker called uh, Pierre Delavaux, a shoemaker near Toulouse. He was arrested uh, while preaching at Nîmes in 1554. In Saint, in western France again, the influence of the little reformed church had an astonishing impact upon the locality. Um, the local society w was cleaned up. Uh, gambling, uh, ballad singing, which in those days was the equivalent of our pop song with all the 
corrupt subliminal messages. That was the equivalent in those days, ballad singing, bawdy songs, um, reveling, you know, drunkenness in the pubs and so forth, murders, foul language, all these things that were so sickened with in the 1990s, they were very common then, but the, 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 the witness of this reformed church in this region had a tremendous impact upon these things. These things dramatically subsided. There was a, a sanctifying of society. People were changed. And one very dominant uh, influence in all this was the singing of the Psalms. Now, here they are, in English, of course, but to the same tunes that were sung at this time. Uh, Calvin had produced his first Psalter in 1539. He produced a new edition in Geneva, and that grew into the full 150 Psalms by 1562. And they were greatly loved. It's hard, perhaps, to emphasize the impact of the Psalms. Uh, they were sung in the home, in private worship, as well as in the temples, uh, where, they, where the people worshipped. They didn't call their church buildings chapels, by the way. They called them temples. On the continent, chapel is a Roman Catholic word. So they called their buildings temples. Uh, they also sang the psalms uh, whilst they were at work in the fields uh, and at the workbench during the day. They had a tremendous impact. Spirits were liberated through the singing of these psalms. Artisans and rustic maidens, everyone, where they received the gospel, these psalms were sung. It's hard for us to understand the tremendous impact of the psalms. And throughout the entire period of the Huguenot troubles and sufferings, the psalms always occupied an important place. Let me just give you one example. There were five scholars, as they know, the five scholars of Lausanne, young men who had been trained for the ministry in Lausanne. They'd received theological training there. And the time came when they wished to return to France to preach the gospel, to evangelize the people. Well, they called in at Geneva on the way. They met Calvin and received instruction and encouragement from him. And then they entered France, and soon they were at Lyon in April 1552. And as soon as they arrived there, they were arrested. And they were thrown into prison, where they were kept for a whole year. And then at the end of that time, they were then to be burned at the stake. And one of John Calvin's most beautiful letters was written to these five young men as they prepared for burning at the stake. But what is so remarkable, I know that uh, in, in some respects this, is, this could almost be judged a morbid subject, but you see we have it in Romans 8. Uh, we are like lambs for the slaughter. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Well, these people knew the meaning of those words as they, they faced uh, being burned at the stake. But it's most remarkable that uh, as they went to the stake, they went singing the ninth psalm. And when they reached there, they were, uh, the, the, the first four were chained to their stakes. And the fifth one, he went round to each of his brethren in turn. And he embraced them and he kissed them. And he said, God bless you, my brother. And that he too was chained. And they were burned in the midst of astonishing rejoicing and a remarkable sense of the Holy Spirit's presence and peace. And the singing of the metrical psalms featured prominently in Huguenot life and faith right the way through these uh, decades. Uh, the first martyrs died with some psalm or other on their lips. Now we have to touch on some of the organizational aspects of the French Reformation and also uh, the interaction with the political situation. Although the attempt by the Cardinal of Lorraine to introduce the Inquisition into France failed, the Huguenots felt sufficiently threatened to organize themselves. Now, in the year 1559, a group of 11 churches organized themselves. They convened the first national synod of the Reformed Churches of France. And uh, this signaled a coming together of groups of believers to form themselves into churches. And within the space of two years, throughout the whole of France, it is estimated that there were 2,150 churches. There were many believers, you see, through all this evangelizing activity. Now they were formed into churches. The 1559 uh, National Synod adopted a confession of faith, which was 
largely prepared by Calvin himself and his pupil de Chandieu. And the articles, as we would ex imagine, ex uh, stress the doctrines of salvation by grace and divine election uh, on the foundation of Scripture as the sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. It is what we would imagine from the whole work of the Reformation, and it is indeed a model confession. Uh, Rome and the Anabaptists were both opposed to this confession because the Reformed did not desire to be associated with the anarchy and the confusion and very often the immorality that had come in through the work of the Anabaptists in Germany and elsewhere. Their church order was Presbyterian, as Calvin had taught in Geneva. In local congregations, the consistory of elders was elected by the people together with a minister or pastor, and they were also deaconed. And once elected, the elders filled up their own vacancies. After the initial election, pastors were to be named by the provincial synod or conference, which was composed of an equal number of ministers, and they met at least once a year. The National Synod of the Final Court of Appeal, or Final Assembly, and this met, or was intended to meet, annually also. And the whole framework and constitution of the French Reformed Churches was intended to balance liberty and authority on the basis of the equality of all believers and of all elders within the churches. Now that was the first thing the National Synod did. They, they, they said, now we must organize ourselves on the pattern of the New Testament, and that was what they produced. Now the French Reformation gained extensive support among the higher classes as well. And there were some very remarkable people who were converted uh, in true evangelical terms and had great influence on the progress of the gospel. One thinks, for example, of a number of women, godly women. The most famous, perhaps, was uh, Marguerite of Angoulême. That's in mid-western uh, France. She was a godly woman. She came under gospel influences. She knew John Calvin. She also wrote very spiritual, evangelical verse. She was a most remarkable woman. If you visit Angoulême today, you will see a very splendid statue of this lady in the city. She had a daughter who was equally zealous for things spiritual and reformed. Jeanne d'Albrecht was her name. She was married to Henry of Bourbon, one of the uh, great French families. And indeed, as we see throughout the whole political troubles, the two great families uh, were locked in conflict. The, the Guise family on the Catholic side and the Bourbon family on the, the Protestant side. Now, Jeanne d'Albrecht was the mother of King Henry IV, King Henry of Navarre, who later became uh, King Henry IV of France. More about him in a moment. But another godly woman was uh, Louise Montmorency. She too was of noble birth, and she had three sons, and they were equally eminent. The most famous of them was her son, Gaspar Collini. He became the most noted of them all. Indeed, he was colonel general in the French army and an admiral of France. And he became the political leader of the whole Protestant party. My recent visit to France, I had the great privilege of seeing a splendid statue of him in Paris. He was a most remarkable man of God. Now, there's no doubt from reading his letters and other information about him that he was a true Christian. He was a born-again, converted man. He also had correspondence with John Calvin, who encouraged Collini in his responsibilities as a Christian citizen. But it has to be said, regrettably, that many of the nobles were attracted to the reform movement for purely personal gain. However, we should not forget that many others were sincerely converted people. There always will be a mixture. The church would always be wheat and tares in the world. And there was example of this um, at this particular time. Now, King Francis II died in 1560, and he was succeeded by King Charles IX. But effective power fell into the hands of his mother, Catherine de' Medici. She was assisted by her Chancellor, Michael L'Hopital. Now, he was a man of noble integrity. He was a friend and a protector of the Reformed churches. Now, the States General, which is the uh, French uh, political assembly, met to initiate 
religious and civil reforms. But the houses of Bourbon or Navarre and Guise were brought into opposition, the former favoring the reform and the latter representing the Catholic reaction. And the Guises were very powerful and they were determined, if possible, to ruin the Huguenots and to prevent the spread of the gospel in French society. The Chancellor did all he could to maintain peace, and it was no easy matter restraining the Catholic mob of Paris from initiating a general massacre of the Huguenots. In fact, the whole atmosphere was extremely tense. I suppose the nearest we could say in modern times to this kind of thing is what happens in Northern Ireland. Even then, it's very localized, as we know. There are friends in Northern Ireland who never know anything about the Troubles. But if you can imagine the kind of tension in certain parts in Northern Ireland, multiply that a hundredfold, and the tension involved, and you will see, understand something of what was developing in France. And very simply because of this, that the old order wished to retain their power and dominance. They weren't interested in liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, things that we take for granted. And the work of the gospel in liberating people to see truth in his own light was a threat to that order. And that is why the dreadful persecution uh, developed at this time. Catherine and the Chancellor were determined to obtain peace. They did their best as politicians, but they weren't very successful. A religious conference was called at Poissy near Paris on September the 9th, 1561. And Theodore Beza, on behalf of the aged Calvin, who only had three more years to live, led the reform delegation, and the cardinals of Tournon and Lorraine led the Catholic party. The Duke of Guise, an inflexible Roman Catholic leader, he directed the debate. The conference failed chiefly over the question of the Mass. You see, the Mass is the heart of Roman Catholicism. The assertion of the repetition of our Saviour's sacrifice for the living and for the dead, the transubstantiation of the elements of bread and of wine through the pretended power of a priest, and the whole of the, of the gospel of justification by faith in the once for all sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all these related truths, this was a threat, you see, to the whole Roman Catholic view of Christianity. And as a result of this, the Huguenots were regarded as intolerable heretics. The situation deteriorated. Even though an edict of toleration was granted to the Protestants on the 17th of January, 1562. But then on Sunday, March the 1st, the Duke of Guise and his troops slaughtered 60 members of a reformed congregation at the town of Vassy. It was a terrible thing. It began the wars of religion, and this single event aroused the Huguenots. Beza demanded justice of the Queen, Queen Catherine de' Medici. Would nothing be done, he pleaded. The Huguenot leaders agonized. And there's a very touching, powerfully moving uh, incident related that as Admiral Collini and his wife were reflecting upon the situation, his wife couldn't sleep. She said, look, here are these are fellow countrymen who are brothers and sisters in Christ, in the Reformed religion, and they're being murdered. And with you, she said to her husband, doing nothing about it, it is as if you were murdering them yourselves. And so the dreadful dilemma, should he just let them be persecuted? Or should he stand by uh, and do, uh, or should he do something? And then he realized that as Admiral of France, not simply as a private individual. He had responsibility for these people. And so for that reason, he intended to utilize the military power at his disposal in order to protect the slaughtered of the Lord. And that was the beginning of the first of the civil wars in France. Now the wealth and the power of the Pope behind the Catholic forces ensured little success for the Huguenots on a long-term basis. They became increasingly demoralized, and battles and massacres were regular facts of life. It isn't a very pleasant period, and yet these are the facts of the time. And it has to be said as well that the spiritual life of the Huguenots declined as they imitated the violence that was used against them. You see, it was violence which was second nature to Roman Catholics. 
They believed that the Catholic religion was to be enforced and spread through violence. They believed that implicitly. But the Huguenots, you see, all they ever wanted was liberty to worship God according to their own understanding. But they were forced into retaliation. One of their more godly soldier scholars, a man called Agrippa Dubine, that name might be just a little familiar, Agrippa Dubine. He was an ancestor of J. H. Mero Dubine, who wrote the History of the Reformation. And in the same family line is the great American Presbyterian theologian Robert Louis Dabney. Uh, Dabney is what happens when the Americans get hold of other people's language. So Dubine becomes Dabney. But this great ancestor, Agrippa Dubine, was a brave soldier. One could almost give a lecture just devoted to this man himself. But he had the honesty to say that at the beginning of the wars, the Huguenots fought like angels. Then they later fought like men. And later, alas, many of them fought like devils incarnate. It should be remembered, too, that uh, there were several Protestants from other countries who joined the Huguenot forces at this time. Sir Walter Raleigh, no less, joined them in the late 1560s. He fought in the Battle of Jarnac in 1569. But uh, that wasn't a very successful time. While Protestants were often hard-pressed, some amazing deliverances occurred, as Richard Heath reminds us. The Huguenot leaders were now seen flying from spot to spot. On one occasion hurrying from Noyer to the other side of the Loire, they and the large company of women and children with them were in the greatest danger. The country was covered with troops and they knew of no bridge or crossing place which would not be blockaded. While wondering what they should do, one of their gentlemen came up and told them that, owing to the late drought, a ford existed where they could cross. They pushed on and by the aid of two or three little boats in which they put the women and children, they got over. But no sooner were they safely landed than a sudden rise took place in the river, protecting them from their pursuers, who by this time were seen on the other side. But now the Loire overflowed its banks, and a boat could not cross without danger. Moved by a deliverance which seemed little less than a miracle, the fugitives fell on their knees and sang the 114th Psalm, celebrating the passage of the Red Sea. Through all this, Admiral Collini himself retained his spirituality and integrity as a man and as a Christian. He entered into an unfortunate alliance with King Charles IX, which eased the situation in 1571, bringing a brief period of peace and liberty to the Reformed churches. The marriage of the Huguenot Henry of Navarre to the king's sister seemed to heal divisions. But the Catholics were determined to utterly exterminate the Huguenots. And so on the night of August the 23rd, Admiral Collini was cruelly murdered. This godly man had indeed been uh, attacked a short while before, but it was not fatal. But he was cruelly murdered on, on the night of August the 23rd. And then on the 24th of August was initiated a most detestable crime, probably the worst of its kind in the whole of history and human civilization. The St. Bartholomew Massacre of August the 24th, 1572. With the murder of the Huguenot leader, there was a great lust for blood. A signal was given for the massacre by a prominent church in Paris. And the next day, the massacre, with all its indescribable horrors, took place. The streets flowed with blood as the sheep of the Lord were viciously slaughtered, including the son-in-law of Admiral Collini. And his daughter later remarried William the Silent of the House of Orange. And it's from that line that the Mountbatten family has come. It's interesting that uh, the Duke of Edinburgh and uh, the Prince of Wales and his family descend from this line, from Admiral Collini, the great French Protestant uh, leader. It should be said in the interest of truth that not all the Catholics 
were party to the killings. The Bishop of Lisieux, for instance, absolutely refused to permit the massacre of Huguenots in his diocese. But he was an exception in the widespread policy of extermination. Many eminent Hugos suffered in this dreadful persecution and uh, massacre. For example, Claude Goudimel, who was a musician. He uh, died in Lyon. Now, he was responsible for the harmonizing of the Genevan psalm tunes for French congregations. The famous Huguenot logician, uh, Pierre de la Ramy, he was a very able thinker and uh, helped to support the, the reformed theology. He, too, lost his life, and many, many others. The king was the traitor of the hour, Charles IX, and the ev events of St. Bartholomew haunted him to his death in 1574. Indeed, right to the last few hours of his life, he was convinced that although all was calm in Paris, he was convinced he could hear screamings. He was on his conscience. It played on him, this terrible, terrible thing that had happened. And indeed, all the Catholic conspirators came to a miserable end. You see, the Lord Eternal is not ignorant of these things. And he knows how to bring justice to those who persecute his people. The Huguenots now organized themselves into confederations. The Protestant cities showed moderation to peaceable Catholics, whilst others in arms were not tolerated. In siege after siege, the Huguenots manifest incredible courage and heroism in the defense of their lives and liberties. It is a most incredible story. However, their cause was greatly weakened by the worldly-minded opportunism of many of the Huguenot nobles. Political Protestantism was nonetheless a force to be reckoned with, despite the misgivings of the more spiritually-minded. Let me just give you one example where, in the midst of all this political intrigue and military activity, how the, the integrity and spirituality and godliness of many uh, came through and shone through. I've already mentioned um, Henry of Navarre, who later became Henry IV. He became the Protestant leader. And he was, in fact, the only soldier of great renown that they ever produced. Collini was the other one, but he was dead. Henry IV was a very great and brilliant tactician on the battlefield. But, although he was the son of Jeanne d'Albret, he was only a Calvinist in his head, if ever he was that. He wasn't really a born-again man. And it was a tragedy that the Huguenots placed so much confidence in him. He was known to be a womanizer, despite his dashing and his daring. The first great victory the Huguenots had was the Battle of Coutras in 1587, down near Bordeaux. And uh, we must imagine the scene here, that the Huguenot forces are on one side of the valley, and the Roman Catholic forces on the other side, under the leadership of the Duke of Joyeuse. Just before the battle, all the Huguenots knelt down and sought the Lord's blessing and protection upon the engagement. And then a most remarkable man stepped forward by the name of Philippe du Plessis Monet, a most remarkable man of God. He was the governor of Saumur. He was a soldier, statesman, and politician, a true champion of the Reformed faith. He was a most godly man. And he had the courage to reprimand the king, Henry Navarre, uh, words to this effect, Your Majesty, how can we possibly expect the blessing of the Eternal on our arms and on this engagement when you continue to live in immorality and your activities have become a scandal to the Reformed churches? Think of the courage. The man could have had his brains blown out at the pull of a trigger. But he stepped forward and reprimanded the leader. Whereupon Henry of Navarre dismounted and he knelt with the soldiers, and he confessed his sin. On the other side, the Duke of Joyeuse, he saw the Huguenots on their knees, and he said, ah, look, there they are, the rascals, they're praying for mercy before we slaughter them. And one of his officers said, uh, no, uh, your lordship, when the Huguenots do that, they intend to fight hard. And so they did, and they stood up, and the whole mass of the Huguenot soldiers, they sang the 118th Psalm to the tune we commenced with this evening. There was a tremendous sense of elation. The battle was over in half an hour. The Catholic forces were routed, and the Huguenots were victorious. They then were on their knees.
and they thank God and the great chaplain, uh, Gabriel D'Amour, with Duchenne Yuk, who was Calvin's uh, pupil, they led in prayer and they preached, and there was a sense of God about the whole occasion, even in the midst of all that activity. Following the death of Catherine de' Medici and the assassination of Henry III, which both took place in 1589, Henry of Navarre became King of France. But the Catholic nobles refused their allegiance unless he abjured his Protestantism. Here was the tragedy. Here's the confirmation that the man never really was a convinced, heart-believing Calvinist. It was at best intellectual. So much so that he did indeed make a calculated political decision. Well, if I stand firm for the truth, a slaughter could continue. But if I renounce my Protestantism, I get the support of the moderate party of the Roman Catholics in France, and peace is possible. Indeed, peace never resulted, but that was how he thought, how he calculated a political decision. But thereafter, the Huguenots felt greatly let down because their leader had denied the faith. Um, later on, there were two assassination attempts. The first one was obviously unsuccessful. Agrippa Dubine, when he spoke to Henry of Navarre, had some very straight words to say to him. Because uh, the assassin's heart, uh, dagger, missed Henry's heart and just cut him on the lip. And uh, Henry uh, made mention of this to Agrippa. And uh, Agrippa responded in these terms, uh, uh, Well, your majesty, uh, since you have only denied the Lord with your lips, your lips alone have been wounded. But should you ever deny him with your heart, the dagger may yet penetrate to the heart. Prophetic words, because that was precisely what happened. In the year 1610, he was assassinated by the Jesuit fanatic Ravillac, and that was the end of Henry uh, IV of France. So he abjured his Protestantism, and uh, his remark was, well, Paris was worth a mass, and so the great letdown occurred. But as a result of all this, to compensate the incensed and disillusioned Huguenots, he granted to them liberty to hold political assemblies and also their religious uh, assemblies as well. But the religious persecution still continued. And then another political dimension came in. You see, it's impossible to extricate it from this. It's part of the story. It isn't thrilling reading, but uh, it's part of the story. Faced by threats of invasion from Spain, Henry was compelled to grant the Huguenots full religious liberty. And all that the Huguenots had ever desired, which was simply liberty, not to dominate the Roman Catholics or to deny them the liberty to worship as they chose. They only wanted liberty to do their own reformed thing, one might say. And so Henry granted the Huguenots in the Edict of Nantes in April 1598 all that they desired, or most of what they desired. Public offices were open to them. Their children could, be, could attend schools. Their sick could be treated in hospital. They were now allowed to print books. All these things were denied them hitherto. And after three quarters of a century, during which over half a million evangelical believers had lost their lives, persecution, massacres, and forcible wars, the Protestants obtained permission to exist and share in the civil privileges of their countrymen. Now the French Reformed churches enjoyed a measure of prolonged peace. Although tensions continued to exist, it was always an uneasy situation. The abjuration of Henry IV set a bad example. Huguenot hangers-on decided they too might defect from the Reformed faith for social advancement and popularity. Thus the Huguenots were divided into the ambitious and timid on one hand and the zealous on the other. The worldliness of one group was opposed by the spirituality of the other. The work and witness of the Reformed churches might have proceeded without hindrance had it not been for the continued determination of the Roman Catholic Church to exterminate the Protestants. You see, when you compare what happened in this country in the reign of Mary, that brief six-year period, and elsewhere in Germany, the persecutions endured by the French Reformed far outstrip anything else anything that happened elsewhere. And why was this? Well, because of the Jesuits, the storm troops of the Counter-Reformation, founded in 1540 by Ignatius Loyola. For those of you who are interested in, in anniversaries, this year is also the 500th anniversary of the birth of Ignatius Loyola.
who founded what I believe may be called the most evil religious movement of all the Christian centuries. That could be documented in gruesome detail. But the Jesuits led the Counter-Reformation with great vengeance in France. But their activities were prepared by a Francois de Sales, who advocated uh, a reasonable, practical, worldly wise kind of piety, divested of all doctrinal debate. See if there's anything familiar in this. He was the kind of man who said, doctrine doesn't matter. Let's be friendly. Let's get together. Let's sink our differences. Let's uh, be at peace. And this peaceable manner disarmed many. It was Romanism with a genial face. It was Romanism with a smile. And at, at once, the Huguenot mentality seemed austere and defensive. And the new influences, influences seemed more attractive. And many younger Huguenots defected from the faith of their fathers at this time. As well as the higher classes, widespread defections were witnessed in the country areas amongst the common people. Superstition and irreligion abounded. There were those who suffered so much from the religious wars that they refused to have dealings with either Rome or the Reform. You can understand this. Of course you can. It was terrible what went on. What would we have done in those circumstances? Wouldn't we have been tempted to say, well, all this religion, the trouble it causes? But then behind all this comes the question, but what saith the scriptures? What is our hope in the face of life and of death? Before eternity, we have no other hope but the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And where is the gospel to be found? In the scriptures, so back to square one. And then they realized that it was either yield on all things for peace with one's fellow, or if necessary, go to the stake with the gospel of salvation in one's heart. The Huguenots were still a power in the land. In 1600, they had 760 parishes, 4,000 of the nobility were Calvinists, and they had 200 fortified places, could still raise an army of 25,000 men. Many of them doubted whether the cause of the kingdom of God should depend upon such material might, of course. And leading pastors such as Pierre de Moulin and Daniel Chamier and others expressed to the king their willingness to accept a reform of the church to its position at the end of the 4th century. They were prepared to, to yield that much. Formally, it was according to the New Testament only. No tradition of any kind. But if peace could come, they would say, well, we'll go with you as far as the end of the 4th century, which was before all the distinctively Roman corruptions became established. But even that was not enough. Such a scheme was never acceptable to Rome, and so the Jesuit-inspired assassination of Henry IV took place in 1610, and the last attempt at reconciliation died also. Huguenot persecution recommenced. There were many who were denied the rights guaranteed by the Edict of Nantes. The Jesuits were slowly gaining the upper hand, particularly in government. And we shouldn't forget that the Jesuits have been active right down through the subsequent centuries. Uh, including the Second World War and their influence on the Nazis and Hitler in particular, the complicity of the Vatican in the Second World War. And behind all this is the dreadful history of the Jesuits. But sadly, the Huguenots relied too much on politics and the sword to maintain their position. The political Huguenots even trusted certain defectors who left the reformed side and went over to the Roman. The Prince du Conde was an example of this, and he later betrayed them. The Catholic reaction began in the province of Béarn, in the southwest region of France, near the Spanish border in the Pyrenees, in 1617. The clergy reclaimed the ecclesiastical property they had lost to the reformed. The Jesuit Arnoux induced King Louis XIII's minister to re-establish Romanism in Béarn. Royal troops destroyed Huguenot temples. They forced the people to attend mass at the point of the sword. They drove pastors away and raped the women. The cursed religion, as the reformed faith was called, was to be exterminated. Threatened by the coming despotism of church and state, the General Assembly of the Reformed Churches met at La Rochelle on the Atlantic coast in 1621. The zealous ensured the acceptance of a policy to completely organize 
Protestant France. In the war which followed, the Huguenots met with a series of misfortunes. The royal army made great advances until the siege of Montauban in 1621. The Huguenots held out for two and a half months, but with bad weather coming in the autumn, the besieging forces were forced to retire for home. And something remarkable happened because the, the night before the siege was lifted, a Huguenot sympathizer in the royal army played on his flute the tune to Psalm 68, the second psalm that we sang this evening. And as soon as that single flute with that majestic tune wafting across the air was heard in Montauban, immediately the morale of the people was, was raised and they knew that their liberty was at hand. Just a, a little musical aside, if you like, on the influence of the Genevan Psalter. The war continued the following year. Cardinal Richelieu, Louis XIII's new minister, was determined to rid France of Protestant influence. And so the Huguenot Commonwealth of La Rochelle was to be humbled and punished. And after a lengthy siege, in the midst of the most appalling suffering, and despite unsuccessful attempts by the English Navy to relieve it, La Rochelle finally fell in 1628. There is a most amazing painting in the museum at La Rochelle of the uh, blockade which was constructed by Richelieu's engineers. And there he is inspecting them, wearing a suit of armor and with his red cardinal's cloak over the top. Typical of the political involvement, the military involvement of the Roman Catholic Church in history. This terrible siege lasted for 18 months, and when Richelieu entered the city in triumph, only 12,000 of the original 28,000 were barely alive. It was the end of political Protestantism. From now on, the Huguenots were to be a downtrodden people, their churches and communities continually harassed by traveling Jesuits. But in the midst of all this oppression, the life of the churches was not altogether extinguished. Pastors were trained and sent to the churches from a number of academies scattered throughout France. An academy had been established at Nîmes as early as 1561, at Montauban and Montpellier in the south in 1598, Sedan up in the northeast of France, in, and Saumur in northwestern France in 1599, and Die in 1604 down in the south. And these academies had a tremendous influence. They trained men. They were excellent in providing pastors for the churches. And uh, in this brief respite of military activity, despite the urgency of the times, there was still much opportunity for theological debate. John Cameron, for example, who was a Scotsman by birth, was a pastor at Bordeaux before becoming professor of theology at Saumur. And whilst the Confession of Faith of 1559 reflected the influence of Calvin's theology, Cameron believed scholastic innovations had been introduced by his successor, Theodore Beza. Cameron showed how the philosophy of Aristotle was allowed to push Calvinism to unscriptural extremes. Cameron was succeeded by Moïse Amaro, his most illustrious pupil, who affirmed Cameron's insights, even proving that in the controversy with Arminianism, the scholastic Calvinism had exceeded the original balanced theology of Calvin himself. Amaro maintained that whilst the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ was efficacious for the elect, yet the atonement was for all mankind in its sufficiency, and it was to be preached accordingly, just as Calvin and the Bible made perfectly clear. Amaro was a very learned and a gracious man, even when Pierre de Mula accused him of heresy. But Amaro became one of the most honored fathers of the Reformed Church, and during the last ten years of his life, he donated all his salary to the poor, irrespective of religious persuasion, whether they were Roman Catholic or Protestant. Pierre de Moulin, though one of the more severe kind of Calvinists, was pastor of Charenton near Paris. He was courageous and devout, dying at the age of 90 in 1658. He just survived. He was four years old at the St. Bartholomew Massacre, and uh, he was preserved. And there were many other professors and pastors who fed the afflicted people of God with the word of God. Congregations could be very large in the cities. And the temple at Charenton was the largest of the Huguenot temples. It was built in 1606. It could hold 7,000 persons in three galleries. It was a huge place. 
And you could imagine that huge building filled with all these worshippers. The preacher needed to have a very powerful voice. And there were also some quaint aspects too, because the preacher and the elders and all the men would be seen wearing hats inside the building. In those days, it was thought to be a courteous thing to wear one's hat in a religious service. Despite the honor and reputation of the Huguenot theologians and many among the nobility, churches became more and more enslaved. National synods had been held at Charenton in 1631, Alençon in 1637, and again at Charenton in 1644. Now, this inter interacts with our own British history at this point because with the success of the English Puritans, Cardinal Mazarin, Richelieu's successor, kept on good terms with the Huguenots, who breathed freely for a while. However, the growing strength of France and the death of Oliver Cromwell in 1658 encouraged Louis XIV to increase Huguenot persecution. And the last permitted national synod took place in 1659 at Loudon. And the king's commissioner, who always sat in on the assembly, he said to them, by the order of the king, Louis XIV, there are to be no more synods. Why? Because they feared political threat of organized Protestantism. So they were banned thereafter. The Roman Catholic hierarchy urged King Louis now to deal with the Huguenot menace with greater rigor than ever. And as the faith and the liberties of the Reformed increased, so unbelief and tyrannical despotism grew alarmingly. Tragically, many Huguenots felt keenly their disqualification for public office, and they compromised their convictions. Then something important happened in 1676, the year of Louis XIV's jubilee. The free-living, pleasure-loving, promiscuous monarch was, as it were, converted. He became a more serious-minded Roman Catholic under the influence of his mistress, uh, Madame de Manton, who now became his wife. The French religious and political establishment now was more determined to root out Calvinism entirely. The children of Huguenots were taken from their families and placed in convents for Catholic indoctrination. Temples were demolished. Colleges and hospitals suffered similarly. The academies, which I mentioned, were all suppressed by 1684. Can you imagine these great university buildings demolished, rafter by rafter, brick by brick? The full force of the absolutism of Louis XIV was out. He who claimed to act directly from God exercised tyranny without mercy. Throughout France, the Huguenot congregations fasted and prayed that God might have mercy on them. The most atrocious persecutions had all Europe in helpless astonishment. In what was known as the Booted Mission, in 1681, known as the Dragonades, dragoons were billeted on Huguenot homes in different parts of the country. And the most terrible things happened. Persecution, irritation, violence, every measure was used, psychological warfare, to make them abjure their religion. And all they had to say was, for the troops to leave home and for them to have peace, all they had to say was, I abjure, I renounce my Protestantism, I accept that the Roman Catholic Church is the true church. That's all they had to say, and the troops would leave them. Can you imagine the pressure? How would you and I have endured that kind of thing? Not surprisingly, there were those who wilted under the pressure. There were others who stood firm, despite the most indescribable things that were done to women as well as children. There was no limit to the bestial treatment of women and children. Not surprisingly, when opportunity presented itself, thousands of them emigrated. I touched on the emigres uh, at the very beginning. They had been tested beyond their endurance. Others gave way under the pressure. And this policy of enforced defection claimed uh, a quarter of a million conversions. But of course they weren't conversions at all. They were simply the response under pressure. And secretly, many of them maintained their convictions, but for fear of the authorities and persecution, they uh, professed the Roman religion. In the prevailing darkness, the faith of the Huguenots produced some courageous spirits. Pierre Durieux, who had been a tutor at Sedan, Claude Brousson, and Jean-Claude of Charenton were faithful pastors. And at the height of the Dragon Age, Durieux exclaimed, Are we Turks? Are we infidels? 
We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. The maxims of our morality are of a purity so great that none could dare deny them. And they were the best people in France. Do you know that in the later generation, those who had emigrated to Germany had such a, a, an elevating ef effect on German society that uh, the German Chancellor Bismarck said that the best of the French were the Huguenots and the best of the Germans were also the Huguenots. Their morality, the, the, their zeal for truth and righteousness and, and industry, hard work, all these moral virtues, they were indeed such good living because they were godly people. And these things, none of them would deny. Uh, we respect kings, says Juria. We are good subjects, good citizens. We are French as much as we are reformed Christians. Claude Brousson, who was born at Nîmes in 1647, was a man of faith and prayer. In defiance of the king, he urged a policy of passive resistance. So he urged that congregations should gather simultaneously at the sites of their ruined temples in an act of witness. Many arrests and killings followed, and Brousson himself escaped to Switzerland, only to return later to be martyred. More of him in the next lecture. Jean-Claude, last of the pastors of Charenton, wrote to his son, of the sorrowful state of the churches. All lower Languedoc has yielded. Anjou, nearly the same. What will be the success of the storm, God only knows. But already I have no hopes of three quarters and a half. Many are called, but few are chosen. As to myself, I shall stand firm, please God, until the end, and do not dream of going away until the last extremity. And he was told eventually to leave France in 48 hours. God will give me the grace to glorify him until the end. I look to his pity for this. And so five days later, on October the 18th, 1685, Louis XIV signed the revocation of the Edict of Nantes at the Chateau of Fontainebleau. The uncertain liberties of the Edict of Nantes of 1598 were officially and finally dead. Rome rejoiced. Te Deums were sung in Rome. And the bells rang out in Rome and other centers of Roman Catholic dominance, whilst the Reformed wept and bled. All pastors had to quit France or be sent to the galleys. Parents were forbidden to instruct their children in the Reformed religion. There was terrible torture, terrible persecution. Can I close by giving you two examples? There were prisons for the women, the men folk, pastors, elders, deacons of churches, if they weren't executed, were sent to be galley slaves in the king's Mediterranean fleet, these majestic galleys powered by oars, manned by five men. And in the midst of criminals of every possible kind, Huguenots were placed. But their only punishment was that they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Reformed faith. The children had been taken from their parents and re-educated, supposedly, in Roman Catholic convents. But there are remarkable stories of fortitude amongst these young children. Do you know that there were cases where parents abjured, and they were rebuked by their young children? You must not deny the Lord. You must not go against his truth. Astonishing, really, what things happen. The most infamous of all the women's prisons was the Tour de Constance at Aigamort, an ancient uh, medieval city on the Mediterranean coast. I was there last month, and it was a most moving occasion to be there. The most famous of those godly women was a Marie Durand. She was a courageous Christian woman, she was in that hellhole for 38 years. On the day of her wedding, she was arrested and sent to this dreadful prison. And you can see etched in the stone around the ventilation shaft the words, resiste, resist supposedly etched by her fingernails and possibly her hairpin. What she etched throughout those years, you can see it today, and I saw it. She was there. She was a most amazing woman. She encouraged the other women. She led them in prayer. She opened the scriptures to them. 
All they had to do to get liberty was to go to the priest who was sitting in an alcove. I saw where this priest sat. All they had to do was to go to him and say, uh, Father, I have Jerome. And there was the door. You could go free. Marie Jerome was there for 38 years. People of all ranks of society suffered the terrible persecution. The last example I would give is of a nobleman, the Baron de Sargasse. I actually went to where he lived. He was a wealthy man. He had large estates. And uh, rather than give up these, uh, he abjured his Protestantism. His wife, on the other hand, was at that moment of more sterling spirit. She would not abjure. She stood firm. And so she prepared to leave her home, her husband, and her children, and all that she held dear to escape because she would not renounce the reformed faith. And so secretly, though in league with some of her servants, she planned to escape. And we actually followed the route that she escaped in the early stage of her escape, uh, eventually to Geneva. And these servants were absolutely brilliant because uh, news was that uh, a warrant was out for her arrest and the dragoons were coming. It was autumn time and there was snow on the ground. The servants reversed the horseshoes on the horses. And so as she made her escape through the snow and the dragoons came and saw the hoof marks, as far as they were concerned, she went that way. But she actually went that way. And so she made her escape. At a time when wolves were roaming in France, it was bitterly cold, but eventually, by God's mercy, she made her escape to Geneva. While her husband had wavered, renouncing his Protestantism, the authorities doubted his conversion to Roman Catholicism, accusing the Baron of supporting the Protestants secretly. Because he was not a sincere Catholic, he was sent to the galleys, those terrible ships that I've already mentioned. And it was whilst he was there that the Lord dealt with him in his mercy. He came to see the error of his ways, and he renounced his abjuration and reprofessed the evangelical faith. And uh, a most remarkable man he was because he became especially noted. He, he became a great encourager to the other Huguenots on the galleys. And his fortitude and joy under the most terrible deprivations and insults uh, was an inspiration to all. He expressed his thoughts, which were later put into verse by a, um, a Huguenot poet, uh, the gist of which was this, that as he was on board this vessel, making its way through the Mediterranean, on a clear day, he could look towards France and see the highest peak in the Cévennes, Montigual, and about 40 kilometers to the north of this mountain was his ruined chateau. But he was not prepared to renounce his Protestantism to return to his former privileges and delights. And this is how this blessed man spoke, the Baron de Sargas. He says, these are the happiest days of my life. I am chained between brigands, but my saviour was crucified between two thieves. And that was the spirit of assurance and blessedness that so many of those Huguenot galley slaves suffered. You see, Naturally speaking, you hear of these details, you go into this history, and it really overawes you with what they endured. And one asked the personal question, well, could I have endured that? They asked the same question. But the answer came to them in truth and in experience. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. The Baron du Sargas proved that. Many others proved that. And why did they prove it? Because this gospel alone is true. There are remarkable stories of conversions amongst the Roman Catholic chaplains on board the galleys. One such example was Father Jean Bion, who was converted as a result of witnessing the tenacity and the courage and the serenity of the Protestant galley slaves. He later fled to England and became a minister in the Church of England and published an account of his experiences aboard the galleys. And the Baron de Sargasse actually occurred many years after the revocation. But they are typical of the cruelties inflicted on the reformed. Perhaps the most famous of the early victims of the revocation was Fulcan Ray, 
Let Samuel's smiles tell the astonishing story. Fulcan Ray was a native of Nîmes, 24 years old. He had just completed his theological studies, but there were neither synods to receive him to pastoral ordination, nor temples for him to preach in. The only reward he could earn by proceeding on his mission was death. Yet he determined to preach. The first assemblies he joined were in the neighborhood of Nîmes, where his addresses were interrupted by the assaults of the dragoons. The dangers to his co-religionaries were too great in the neighborhood of this populous town. And he next went to Castre and the Bonage, after which he accepted an invitation to proceed into the less populous districts of this event. He felt the presentiment of death upon him in accepting the invitation, but he went, leaving behind him a letter to his father, saying that he was willing, if necessary, to give his life for the cause of truth. Oh, what happiness it would give me, he said, if I might be found amongst the number of those whom the Lord has reserved to announce his praise and to die for his cause. His apostolate was short but glorious. He went from village to village in the Cévennes, collecting the old worshippers together. He prayed and preached to them, encouraging all to suffer in the name of Christ. He remained at this work for about six weeks, when a spy who accompanied him, one whom he had regarded as sincere a Huguenot as himself, informed against him for the royal reward, and delivered him over to the dragoons. Ray was at first thrown into prison at Andouze, when, after a brief examination by the local judge, he was entrusted to thirty soldiers to be conveyed to Alès. There he was subjected to further examination, avowing that he had preached wherever he had found faithful people ready to hear him. At Nîmes, he was told that he had broken the law, in preaching contrary to the king's will. I obey the law of the king of kings, he replied. It is right that I should obey God rather than man. Do with me what you will. I am ready to die. The priests, the judges, and other persons of influence endeavored to induce him to change his opinions. Promises of great favors were offered him, if he would abjure. But when the Entendant Baville informed him of the frightful death before him if he refused, he replied, My life is not of value to me, provided I gain Christ. He remained firm. He was ordered to be put to the torture. He was still unshaken. Then he was delivered over to the executioner. I am treated, he said, more mildly than my saviour. On his way to the place of execution, two monks walked by his side to induce him to relent and to help him to die. Let me alone, he said. You annoy me with your consolations. On coming in sight of the gallows at Beaucaire, he cried, Courage, courage, the end of my journey is at hand. I see before me the ladder which leads to heaven. The monks wished to mount the ladder with him. Return, said he. I have no need of your help. I have assistance enough from God to take the last step of my journey. When he reached the upper platform, he was about, before dying, to make public his confession of faith, but the authorities had arranged beforehand that this should be prevented. When he opened his mouth, a roll of military drums muffled his voice. His radiant look and gesture spoke for him. A few minutes more, and he was dead, and when the paleness of death spread over his face, it still bore the reflex of joy and peace in which he had expired. There is a veritable martyr, said many even of the Roman Catholics, who were witnesses to the death of this amazing young man. The consequences of the infamous revocation of the Edict of Nantes were to be felt in the next century. Whether the absolutism of King Louis XIV was to prove a match for the power wisdom and grace of the living God is a question for the continuing story.